might be forgiven for thinking that this was going to be some kind of sci-fi apocalyptic vision of the future, but I'm happy to tell you that it's not. We're going to be talking a little bit about how you can turn a huge urban waste stream in the form of waste coffee grounds into delicious gourmet oyster mushrooms, and why the very best place to do that is in our cities. And we should also look at how this idea is already beginning to catch on in, in urban areas around the world. But I can see a couple of slightly bemused looking faces in the audience, and you're probably wondering how on earth did they get into this? Uh, so we'll go back in time to 2011. I had not long finished university and set up a small business growing mushrooms in the traditional way on straw and sawdust. And about a year into that, came across the fact you could grow on waste coffee grounds. And I knew instantly that it was a fantastic idea. Not only was there all of this waste, but it was actually easier to grow mushrooms on coffee than it was in the way that I'd been doing so already. So overnight, I switched focus of, of the business and ran some trials. And I remember distinctly going into Plymouth to pick up loads of coffee uh, in the run-up to Christmas one year. Everybody was walking along with their shopping bags, and I was pushing a trolley with black bin bags full of waste coffee in through the middle of the shopping center. And I look up, and in front of me stood a security guard and he looked at me very strangely and said, what are you doing? Uh, and I explained, well, you know, I'm taking all this waste coffee and using it to grow mushrooms. And he looked so, so confused at the whole thing. <laughs> However, had I been able to show him this picture at the time, maybe he would have understood it a little bit better. What you can see there is the waste from about 1,000 cups of coffee being very quickly, in the space of just four weeks, turned into a delicious crop of oyster mushrooms. And when I look at this photo, it still inspires me to this day, the potential to use nature and the evolution uh, of a biological organism to, set, to solve some of our pro biggest problems. And you might ask, well, is coffee waste such a problem in the first place? And yes, it is, basically. Uh, you probably have noticed over the last five or 10 years, hundreds of coffee shops springing up on our high streets, uh, yet it's an incredibly wasteful uh, process. So I'm just going to walk you through very briefly the stages from you know, coffee bean to the cup that you enjoy, and just think about the waste that goes into each step of that process. So the coffee plant is, is produced in the country of origin and all the time and resource and energy that goes into that. It's then picked, dried, milled, packed up and shipped halfway across the world, where it's then roasted at high temperature, transported to the cafes where it's ground, put through an espresso machine, and we get that lovely uh, liquid extract to drink and enjoy. Now, here's the interesting thing. Less than 1% of the biomass of the plant that's gone through this whole process ends up in the drink. You know, it's a liquid extract. Uh, the waste coffee grounds are usually just tapped out in the bin and buried in landfill. Incredibly wasteful, but... The silver lining to all this is the fact that uh, they're incredibly good then for growing mushrooms on. They're full of nutrients, they've just been pasteurized by the brewing process, which makes it e easy to grow mushrooms on, and the mushrooms can come along and sort of mop up this huge waste stream and problem that we've created. So those were Adam's first steps in the um, Grow Cycles business, and let's fast forward a few years to, um, to when we're the proud operators of the UK's first urban mushroom farm. I'm sat in some luxuries, luxurious offices in the heart of Exeter. And they're not unlike the offices I used to work in, in London, when I worked for major energy companies. So these offices are supposed to be comfortable, right? But I wasn't comfortable at all. I was sick to my stomach. I'd just been handed some bad news, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with the feeling you just want to curl up. What was the bad news? Well. We were the proud operators of this farm, and the landlord had just told us, this was the start of this year, that we had to be out in a very short space of time. So there I was, sat, pondering, looking out the window, thinking, what does this actually mean? You know, is this the end for what we've been doing? We've been working at this for years now, and I, I wasn't sure we had the drive to do it all again, so felt pretty sorry for myself. And then the landlord interrupted the silence and said, look, but... You know, I've got some good news as well. There's an unused floor right above us here. And would you like to have a look? And we had a look, and it's just a completely empty floor, hardly used. There's plenty of those spaces in, in every city in the UK, um, I regret to say. And his question was, would you like to build your urban mushroom farm here? It didn't take us all that long to say, yes, 
we'll do that. But that also meant we needed to find some money to invest in this, and we, we needed to design and build the new farm. So we did all of that with the amazing support of backers through a crowdfunding campaign, and we built and designed the farm in less than a month. And this here is the result. So those, you can see, those are the bags that Adam showed you earlier, and this is right in the heart of the city. Now at this stage, some of you might be wondering, so what is the big deal? Why are you in the city? And besides the reason that there's plenty of waste over there, there's also the demand for the food. There's some other compelling reasons too. So the United Nations predict that 2050, 70% of the world's population will live in cities. So that simple fact needs, means that we need to carefully consider how we structure these cities. And we think a farm such as this one should be in the fabric of all the cities around the world. Now, don't get us wrong. We don't mean to say that this is the answer, the, the answer to all of our problems. We just simply think it's part of an answer. So that's in 2015. But even if you look right at this moment, 30% of the world's food production never reaches a table, never reaches a dinner table. That's 30%. So we've got these enormously long, complex supply chains with bottlenecks inevitable and various stages, and it simply never reaches our table. What we do here hardly has got any supply chain involved in it. It's local food production. So how much could we do? Well, to run our farm, we pick up about, from five cafes, we pick up nearly 500 kilograms of coffee waste each week if all of us would get involved, there's 17,000 coffee shops in the UK alone at this moment. If all of us would get involved and start making mushrooms, I can't see it happen next year, but perhaps in the future, we'd be talking about producing about 300 tons of mushrooms each week, and that's an awful lot of mushrooms. <laughs> so this brings us back to the original question, will mushrooms take over our cities? And Perhaps it's a little bit too early to say, but I can certainly see a world five to ten years from now where there's a farm like that in every city in the world recycling waste into food for local consumption. Now, over the last couple of years, we have got a lot of emails from people that have uh, been asking us, well, how, how do you do this? How do you grow mushrooms from coffee? And to begin with, we used to answer every single one of them, and it didn't take us long to realise that was not the best way of uh, teaching this idea to people. Um, when mushrooms grow in the wild, they tend to sort of, underneath the soil, grow out in all directions in this very intricate and amazing network of almost like a, a set of roots. And the famous mycologist Paul Stamets likens this structure to the internet in the way that uh, ideas spread and are intermingled and connect and new things come out of them. So it was only natural for us to turn to the internet as a, as a means to spread this idea. Uh, so we formed an online course as a way to teach the technique and it turns out the internet really is a great place for spreading ideas because within six months of launching the course we had hundreds of members in more than 23 countries around the world on six different continents. Some of those people are now going on to set up projects of their own. So this idea of where it might lead to is already in motion. So when we set out to do this, when we started this journey, we had no idea of where it would take us. It's all uncharted territory. Plenty of people thought we, we were absolutely crazy, and there have been a lot of bumps along the way. But by taking small steps forward, we are making a difference now. So if anybody here has got an idea that they think can make a difference, we'd, we'd encourage you to go for it. It's not only about taking action, it's also about inviting other people into your way of thinking. And you never know where that might lead to. Thank you. <laughs>